Good evening, everyone. Um, we'd like to welcome Dr. Wayne House this evening, who's filling in for Robbie while he's um, on a short sabbatical. Uh, Dr. House has spoken for us many times in the past, and we're definitely looking forward to what he has for us this evening. Take it away. All right. Um, it's good to be with you again. Uh, I was trying to decide what to speak on, and I've gotten a lot of feedback from people regarding uh, my series that I did on archaeology and the Bible. And I was explaining beforehand that when I did that initially, I thought maybe I'd be doing a couple of these and normally be coming in just doing my regular sermons from various places in the text. And so I sort of stuck some things in here and there just for interest, not realizing that I would be actually doing so much more. And so there may be a little redundancy on occasion, but I've made an effort to try to bring out different nuances from anything that I've had in the past, but I've, I've largely kept it different and added things to it. So that's what I've done. But <clears throat> I've had feedback not only from, uh, from uh, 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 Pastor Robbie, but also from uh, the people who watch it at home and so forth, that this is something that people would enjoy having. And, and I love doing it. I was, you know, I've done a lot of archaeology I've written two books on it, so I've picked up a couple things here and there along the way. I've been on the excavations, and I've done a lot of study in the area. So that sort of, uh, are we okay? So uh, that brings us to where we are. So I thought I would do this a little differently tonight since I found out from Pastor Robbie that he wanted me to, uh, to do the archaeology stuff. He said, that's, that's really good. So I said, okay, I'll do some different kinds of things in this. And so uh, this one is called Archaeology and Unfamiliar Biblical Sites in Turkey. <laughs> now, I did the seven churches one time before. I could do more than I did because I probably ran off the clock on that. And I've been there many times and really enjoy it. But uh, so what I thought I would do is take some places that I haven't taken you to pretty well and show you some stuff that's fascinating. Now, I have my advertisement at the bottom. See the House Visual Study Bible for more discussion of archaeology and the Bible. Uh, this study Bible, it's a nearing. I should have the New Testament done hopefully in October, and then I'll be moving on to finish what I've done in the Old Testament and get that done. But it's a lot and a lot of work. Years ago, I did a little, a little Bible called the Nelson Study Bible. That took eight years, and that was a lot of work. And what this is is about ten times that much work. It really is. I know what it is. It's a lot of work. <laughs> so it just takes time. And, uh, and I have several of you who have been very encouraging, which I appreciate. I'm trying to produce something that has never been done before, and that's been checked out already. It hasn't been. And so we're tr we've already contacted with about seven or eight different language groups that want to translate it so that they can have a study Bible in their own language. And so that's going to be real exciting to have that to happen. I mean, uh, that's really great. Uh, just in case you wonder, this site actually was taken when I was younger. And it's uh, at the, underneath the, uh, the city of Smyrna in the, in the, in the uh, underground uh, ch uh, channels and, and tunnels and so forth. And that's what's there. But moving along, we're going to just tackle some stuff. And you, I don't mind if you have questions. It's very fine with me to answer questions. But I'm going to try to put some things together that are a little different. Now this right here, if you'll notice, uh, shows you a map. It very, very, uh, doesn't include a lot in the map, but it includes what I need tonight. And I was going to use a, uh, a pointer, but I was told I can't do that. Let me see if I can make this little thing here point. Oh, there it is, but is it going to make it? Okay, can you see that? Oh, yeah, okay, that'll work. Uh, we're going to cover some cities. One is called uh, Miletus, and that's not here. It's actually over here. <laughs> over here, uh, that's the city that Paul asked the Ephesian elders to meet him at when he was on his way to Jerusalem. Remember that? Meet me in Miletus. One of the best sites in the place. I mean, it's a phenomenal site. And we're going to get into that one. But also we're dealing with the... Um, I'll tell you. <laughs> Come on, there we go. Uh, we're also going to deal with Colossae. And uh, we're not going to talk about Laodicea. That's one of the seven churches. There's far more about that than I've talked about before. I used to go there when there was nothing there. And we, a guy took me and a couple friends out that went to see the sites in Turkey and Laodicea. And we got there and we parked. I said, where's the, where's the site? And he said, it's right over there. 
I said, there's nothing there. He said, well, they haven't done anything. It's all underground. Well, that doesn't help a lot. So I got out and I started exploring and I know enough about how Greek theaters or over against Roman theaters are created that uh, I thought that looks like a place a Greek theater would be put because they didn't build on columns, they built in the earth. And so I began to dig around a little bit and kick things here and there and I saw stones and I thought, aha, theater. <laughs> and since that time though, it's become almost a rival to Ephesus. It's a phenomenal site, and uh, we can say more about it, but I'm going to skip it here because I'm doing unfamiliar sites. Now, and you may say all that's unfamiliar to me, but I'm sorry. I'm just saying, generally speaking, people know virtually nothing about what I'm talking. So uh, we're going to talk about Colossae and Heropolis here. We're going to talk about a site that's about here called Aphrodisius, and we're going to talk about the site... Um, of uh, Heropolis, and so that's phenomenal. Let's move on. Let's go to Colossae first. If you look here, um, how do I get this thing to work? Uh, this is another map that I found online, and the reason I used it, because it, it pr provided some more understanding of the geography a little bit more. So you'll see Colossae here, by the way, which has never been excavated. I've gone there many times, I keep hoping that somebody would do something. <laughs> There's a big mound there, which you'll see in a moment, and I will climb the thing, what do, the, what do they call a tail, uh, which is a mound is what it means. And I walked around the, uh, I think, matter of fact, arena, were you with me at that time? We walked around the edges of it, and I say, there is a, a wall here. <laughs> somebody needs to dig down and get that thing. So the fact is, they are starting excavations in 2024. So I've been wanting that for 20 years. And finally, they're doing it. So that's exciting. But uh, that is, so that shows you Colossae. Here's Heropolis. And it's right, it does not, it's not obvious here, but I'll show you that's a big, big valley called the Lycus Valley. And I'll show you pictures. And here's Laodicea. It shows you how close it is. And in just a moment, when I get to that point, it will make sense to you because uh, there's a, a relationship between Laodicea, uh, a place called Colossae, and Heropolis. There's a relationship that's important in the Bible in the book of Revelation. And when I get to that point, I'll talk to you about it. And I'm going to take you all the way over here. We've got to find a way to make this work better. Okay, Ephesus. Now, Ephesus is a major, major site. It's where Timothy was pastor and also where a man by the name of uh, uh, John who wrote the Revelation, lived, as did his, uh, the mother of Jesus because John took Mary into his care and took her to Ephesus when he centered his work there. And, of course, he did all the work around the seven churches that are here, which are in themselves very interesting. Now, I take tours to all these places all the time. I've got a, a tour set up right now for 2024, but I've got another group that want to go somewhere in late 2023. I don't know how that's going to work. But uh, these are places that are fascinating. I love Turkey. I really do. Uh, I mean, Israel has to come first, but Turkey is a close second. St. Paul to the church at Colossae. Now, you've read the book of Colossians, right? If you've read the New Testament, you've read the book of Colossians. And this is a statement of the Apostle Paul. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus through the will of God. Important statement, by the way. He said, I didn't decide to do this. <laughs> it's God's will that I do it, and we know the story, right? And Timothy, our brother, and he was Paul's protege of a sort, but Timothy was pastoring in Ephesus, according to tradition, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you should ever desire these, I'm more than happy to make them available but I've written four journal articles on the, on the church at Colossae dealing with different aspects that was published in this, the journal at Dallas Seminary, a Bibliotheca Sacra. And I deal with different aspects of this, and I'll share a little bit of that now, but it would take the whole time to talk about each one. So if you ever want that, I can easily make that available by PDF if, if anybody wants it. But uh, the fact is, he's talking to a church that has many, many problems. Do you notice he does that so often? 
uh, our church's problem sometimes apparently so because Paul encountered at Corinth. He had issues at Thessalonica. You know, he had had problems here at Colossae. Uh, you know, you start going through the churches and there were a lot of issues. But we're going to find here this one at Colossae. Now, you can spell that two ways, by the way. You'll see it C-O-L-O-S-S-E, and you'll also see it in the Roman form, which is C-O-L-O-S-S-A-E. Oftentimes in, in Latin, you'll have the A-E. And so according to what you take is the form that you get it from. But either way, it's the same place. And, uh, and there's a mound there. Colossae was 12 miles from Laodicea, and it was to the south... Uh, uh, east of that, and far across the Lycus Valley, you found the place called Heropolis that we're going to see in a few minutes. And uh, throughout its history, it was known for its fabric, fabrics, they, dealing with uh, clothing. But that's also true of Laodicea, by the way. Although Laodicea had some things going for it, they had developed an ointment for the eye that was very, very well known throughout the world. So some of these places had some things that... Uh, that made them famous within the world of their time. We do the same thing. We have cities that are more known for something or another. And this is true here uh, for its fabric. And uh, it attracted many Jews to the city. And the reason why is because oftentimes Jews were very good at certain things. And they did these things because it didn't hold them down in case they had to leave quickly. Do you know that? Jews historically, they were people that were persecuted and so they had to have something that did not tie them down. They could take their money and their goods and run. And if you've seen Fiddler on the Roof, which probably many of you have seen, you see that kind of situation occurring. Well, anyway, this was a church founded by a man by the name of Epaphras. And you know the word Epaphras from Paul's writings. He mentions Epaphras very often. Epaphras had been sick. Paul had prayed for them. He had become well. Uh, he was influential in this particular church at Colossae, uh, and also Timothy was there. Now, we don't know too much about Paul's t uh, where he, whether he went to Colossae or not. There's no definite statement that said he did. But he did, in fact, write to them a, a blistering letter of a sort, <laughs> and that they had some serious heresies in the church. And so he wrote to try to uh, help them to deal with these issues, and I'll be showing these to you briefly. And some people make some mistakes when they talk about this, and I'll correct those at the time. But uh, we don't know that Paul came there, but it was the home of Philemon. We know the letter of Philemon, the man who ran away from... Who was it? The guy's name was Onesimus, and he ran away from this, this master. And he found himself in jail, right? And Paul sent him back. You know that story. Uh, Christianity thrived over the centuries there until about the 700s. And uh, they had a lot of people that started coming in, taking over the country at that time. wonder who was coming in in the 700s that was running across Europe. Uh, you'll have to think on that a while. But uh, nonetheless, they, if you go to, to Turkey, one thing you find interesting is that if you go into the, a little bit north, about center of the country, and over toward uh, where you have the, Turkey actually goes all the way across all these countries. So it's like almost like a, a, a Florida or something, you know, that have these big, long area. But if you go where Antioch is and go to the, to the Mediterranean Sea that borders, let's say, Israel down, if you're thinking of that as Turkey, it's about right here. And they had underground cities that they hid in. They've now found a third one, but I've been in two of them. And they hid in these cities from people that were seeking to conquer them and take over and so forth. And that happened in the, uh, the time of the, uh, uh, in the days of the Romans, when Christianity was being persecuted at this point, but also when the Islamic invasion occurred. So that's a fascinating thing to visit if you ever get a chance, if you have never been underground a long ways in a city that was built. So it's different than what you probably think, but I'll not elaborate. Now, uh, the area of Turkey is important in church history as well, not so much the New Testament on the things we're talking about here, 
Uh, the big cities on the New Testament are what we think of as some of the seven churches, some of the places in Greece, and so forth. Uh, Turkey, not so much, but it became very important in church history because in AD 325, there was a council held in Turkey up in a place called Nicaea, which was the place that a, an emperor uh, set it up, he lived. And uh, they had the council of Nicaea where they dealt with the question of what was called Arianism, which said that Jesus was a created being. And that becomes important later on in, in church history. Uh, Jesus also has a caricature here at Colossae that's uh, uh, a significant one to talk about because it later on developed into what we call in about 130 A.D., 100 years after, uh, excuse me, 30 years after John. Uh, he wrote about some aspects of it we're going to talk about, same thing at Colossae, but it really only fully became a major religious view about 130 and mainly in Egypt, and it's called Gnosticism. Have you ever heard the word Gnostic or Gnosticism? Well, that occurred, it began to formulate, and I'll show some of that to you in just a moment. Um, so let's move along here a little bit. We're going to, uh, um, I think I pretty well covered everything I want to there, so I can actually move past that. This is another look, it's from the south. You can see the mound a little bit there. This is another view, it's a lot closer to it, and is looking at it from, um, let's see, let's see. I think that's a northern look. But I've climbed on the, around the top of that several times. And, but if you come right this way, you have the lower city, which is pretty devastated, not much there. But I'm sure when they start the excavations, a lot of that will become evident. But what's fascinating about Colossae is what it has in, in reference to the revelation of the church of the, uh, Laodicea. Because we hear about Laodicea, it says you are either, you know, you're neither hot nor are you cold. And I know how people used to teach that when I was a kid in church. They got it wrong. But, uh, you know, you're on fire for Jesus, you're cold, you know, backslidden or something or another. You know, hot and cold that way. It has nothing to do with the text. Uh, matter of fact, hot and cold is good, as I'm going to show you. If you don't believe it, try to drink hot water over against cold water, according to certain times, or... You know, hot and cold are good according to what you're doing. Cold steak, hot steak, you got to figure this out. So hot and cold are not negatives, either one. The problem with them is they were lukewarm, neither of them. <laughs> and that, that's what we find at, at, uh, at Laodicea. And let me show you something here. And this right here is right near that mound I just showed you. I wish I, where I'm standing, if I were on the mound right now, I could walk down and it'd be, you know, maybe 40 feet over that way. The water is flowing in these channels, uh, and the reason why is because of this. There's a river close by, and one day when I was there with a, when I had a car, I actually drove back behind the mound into the forest somewhat because <laughs> I wanted to see where all this water is coming from, and I found it, and this is what it is. They had these rushing uh, streams that were there, and they were supplying the city of Colossae with very cold water. And then on the ground, you could put your hand in it. It was cold. And that's important for the story because Colossae, Hierapolis, Laodicea. And what John says, you're neither hot nor cold. They would have been thinking of Colossae just a few miles away from it. The cold water, they were famous for it. Running cold water. Well, let's move on. Let's talk about heresy. We'll come back and talk about the issue of Hierapolis. But here's the heresy issue. Lots of heresies were developing at Colossae. They were not steeped in Jewish thought. A lot of churches had the benefit because Paul, when he went to a community, what did he do? First thing he went? The Jewish synagogue. You go to some place that you're familiar with and you can make an impact. You, you have some things in common. You both use a Bible. Uh, we just came out with a book not long ago by Walt Kaiser. I have a little publishing company. We just published this book called uh, The Old Testament Really Matters. Did you see that? Did I have that to you? I have to bring one to show you to if you have an interest. It's a great book. It says The Old Testament Really Matters. The subtitle is uh, Encouraging Believers to Read the Bible of Jesus and the Early Church. That's what they read. Do you realize when Paul said 2 Timothy 3, 16, he said, All Scriptures God breathed. That's before almost any of the New Testament was written. 
wonder what he's talking about. <laughs> so that uh, you have this, this issue here that the church at Colossae was not well steeped in Scripture to begin with, but they were steeped in some alternate way of religious thinking that was occurring in the day. And I mentioned some things. Obviously, Christianity began to make an impact into Colossae. Judaism had a little bit, but not a lot. Where they mainly got their influence is out of Greek philosophical ideas. And that's what happened eventually. The mystery cults, Judaism, Christianity, and all of these began to take place in the second century in Egypt, and they developed a viewpoint called Gnosticism that became very prominent in aspects of the church and was declared a heresy, as it was. Had all sorts of strange views about Jesus and everything else. And so it was an amalgamation of various doctrines that rejected Christ. But some of the ideas that we find at Colossae and also in Egypt are discussed by John in the very last uh, decade of the first century. You know what John talks about? He says, any man who says that Jesus Christ did not come in the flesh is not out of God. He says you can't deny the physicality of Jesus and be a believer. Because they were arguing that the body is irrelevant. The body is, is virtually, you, God would not enter into a physical body. So Jesus was an apparition. He was a phantom. He was a non-tangible being. And that's why it becomes important when Paul starts talking about, and John starts talking about, that Jesus, He was in the flesh, that He had blood that spilled on the cross. You, you bring those tangible elements into the fact that we believe that God actually entered into humanity, true humanity, not just a, a mirage of it, but a reality of it. And that you find that teaching in Paul and John and other places in the New Testament. Uh, second century Gnosticism rejected. Here's what their view was. If you look at this Gnostic worldview, they believe that the Lagos, which is Jesus, right? They use the word Lagos, that the Lagos actually was a, an angelic kind of being. And that God, the true God, this magnificent spirit being, would never touch anything that has anything to do with humanity. He was way far away from creation and humans and so forth because he couldn't touch humanity. That would be sinful. So everything that's true and good is spirit. Everything bad is physical. That's how they operated their life. And they had ways to do with that. Uh, but that's more involved than I'll go into right now. But if you notice here, in this, this chain, you notice the Lagos is here. And then the Lagos created this spirit being who was a little bit less spiritual than he was, and who created this spirit being, who created this spirit being, who created this spirit being. I mean, this is really what they taught. Until they finally created one called the Demiurge. We would use the word Satan who then is involved in a group of angels that were involved in creating the world. So God didn't create the world through this chain of less and less uh, spiritual beings came finally someone who could touch humanity and physicality and the earth. That's their doctrine. Now, if you understand that, when you read 1 John, when you read things in Colossae and other things, you'll see terminology that Paul and John and others use to combat that idea of thinking. But if you don't have any background in this, you think, what are they talking about? Uh, now, I mean this, please understand me when I say this. Hear me out, okay? Uh, some people, they, they react too quick. None, none of the Bible was written to us. I have my name nowhere in there. He doesn't say, Dear Wayne. I'm separated from this writing a couple of thousand years. <laughs> it wasn't written to me. It was written to people who are in a particular historical setting with certain ideas, influences, and so forth. All of the Bible was written for me to benefit from, 
as I seek to honestly and carefully deal with the text to understand it. That's why people who go to churches that all they do is just sort of feel good and they never study the Bible, they really never get in contact with, in fact, what God's saying. They're operating on all sorts of, uh, you know, suppositions and, you know, they might as well use, uh, what do they call those little cookies? Uh, uh, fortune. fortune cookies, yes. They just use those because you have to actually read the Bible intelligently, understanding the words and, the, and, and understanding the culture and understanding the history and understanding the context. That's what we've been called to do. It's called work. Study to show yourself, right? A workman. <laughs> See, it's work to understand the Bible. It doesn't come by sleeping in a Bible at night or reading daily bread even. The, the point of it is the Bible is a book that God wrote for us, inspired, but He wrote it to certain people whose context we have to get into. That's why we're doing the archaeology here. I could also be teaching a class for you in hermeneutics, interpretation. Matter of fact, I'm teaching right now at one university a Ph.D. course in hermeneutics and one in archaeology, so it all fits. So the fact is it takes work. But, you know, I like the work. I'd like the work if I weren't being paid for it. I'd still do it. I love to read and study the Scriptures because it's where I find what God thinks and what He wants of me. Right? And so understanding What's behind all of this helps to understand terminology that comes about. So let's look at here. Look at this words, Paul's words. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible things, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things have been created through Him and for Him. He is before all things, and in Him all things are held together. Does that sound like anybody else? This is a test. Who talks like this elsewhere in the Bible? About 30 years, no more than that, probably 40 years or so after this was written. The guy's name is called John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The Word was God. All things were created by, through Him, and not without Him. Anything was made that was made. Does that sound similar? It does. They're teaching the same thing. The Lagos is not a created being like Arius taught in the, in the third, uh, 300s. The the Bible teaches that Jesus actually is God who came into the flesh. Philippians chapter 2, 5 following discusses that. And so He is God, the Almighty God, because God is Trinity. And you, you've probably had that taught to you. But that's where they're going with this. And Paul, by these words, is teaching people that did not understand this because they really are clueless. He's trying to counteract their teaching that they've received before in Greek thought. And you can read all these other words here about it. Now, this is what you see then. He speaks about Christ in creation, Christ in redemption, and how he does that by the various passages that he covers. But I'm here to talk more, do some more archaeology with you. So I wanted you to understand that, that the church there at Colossae, understanding it's important understanding the book. Let's say some things about Heropolis. By the way, do you, when you see the word polis, anybody have an idea what that word means? City, right? Polis. And so you have Heropolis means, here, here, Heropolis, that first word means holy. So it was called the holy city. Now, that's even before you had a Christian ring to it. It was just sort of one that, it's a Greek term that means to set apart. And so you find this statement, For I testify about him, he's writing in Colossians, that he has great zeal for you and for those in Laodicea and for those in Heropolis. You only have Heropolis refer one other time to my knowledge in the New Testament, and that's at the 
uh, when you have the day of Pentecost and you have the people from all the various places, I believe he mentions, Luke does, mentions Heropolis there too. So yeah, I think you have two references to it. So it's not as significant in the days of the first century, even though several important people lived around there. Okay? It became important in the second and third centuries when you had people like Papias, who was a disciple of John and Polycarp, very important church fathers. But uh, you see where it is. It's up high, and it's across a big, big valley here with Laodicea in between. So Heropolis... Laodicea and Colossae. Now, let's uh, look at Heropolis. Today it's called Pamukkale. That's the, um, uh, that's the Turkish name. And uh, there was no apostolic letter to it, but it had some important people connected to it. They recently found within the last, ooh, I'd have to count math the years, but the last 15 years, let's say, they discovered the, the tomb of the apostle Philip. Not the evangelist, the apostle Philip, and two of his daughters. They were both, all three martyred in Heropolis in the first century. And now they have the tomb there, and I'll show it to you. But uh, this uh, archaeological work was done in combination with several people participating from different angles. But um, you find that uh, this particular church here has some fascinating things that others don't. What happened in, in uh, before the days of the second century, there was already uh, a belief that at this place and also at a place called Caesarea Philippi, that they were gates to Hades. That's how you got to the underworld. And the priests, they were pagan priests, at Heropolis, they would actually take uh, animals like birds and put them into this area and the bird would die. Well, we now know why, because there was poisonous gases from there. Uh, but they would also jump in there occasionally from a different, they had another, it's, what I'm going to show you is, looks like you, you'd have to climb and get in. There's another location there too. But they would actually walk in there and walk out of there and not die. And they were, after the animals died, they, they were viewed as being magical and spiritual. And what they probably did is hold their breath. <laughs> because when you go in there, you don't want to stay there long or they would have to have a lot of funerals going on. But the fact is, uh, this is the entrance to the holy city, Heropolis. Now, if you were to go through that and keep going to the road, on the, which is quite a ways away, it may be the biggest cemetery in the history of the world. They have got, I can't tell you how many hundreds of, of, of tombs and graves there. It's just packed. But you'll find out the reason why in just a moment. But uh, it's fascinating when you drive through. And they have every variety of tomb and, uh, you know, people put up fancy ones and not fancy ones and all sorts of stuff. But that's a place that Greeks came to die. And we'll find out why. Now, here's a theater at Heropolis. And if you were to actually go behind that theater, then you would actually see where the uh, thing, where the gate of Hades is. I mean, as they're saying it. If you go to Caesarea Philippi, where Jesus said, you know, upon this rock I'll build my church. He said, the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. That Hades is a Greek word, the underworld, the world of the dead. And it became to be viewed as, a, you know, the world of Satan, which there's, the parallel is probably is pushed too much. It's a world of the dead. And so... If you go to uh, Caesarea Philippi, there's a big, big hole in the wall there that the temple to Augustus Caesar used to be. Behind that is where they view the gate of Hades to be. So that's how you get into the underworld. Here's another view of the theater, looking down at it this way, the other way. And it's a fairly good-sized theater. Uh, I don't know how they kept people getting killed in these things. they got these all over the place. And if you ever slip and fail, you'd be bouncing down stone. I don't know how they... I don't know if they carried insurance or what. But anyway, you have, you have uh, all these theaters of this way. Here's the tomb of the Apostle Philip. It's very, there's also an inside view, but I didn't show you. It's got three slabs, and that'd be because of him and his daughters. But uh, that's, that's the tomb of the Apostle. Now, here looks across what is called the Lycus Valley. Now, where you're seeing to the right here 
is what had, has occurred since originally I went there and found some stones underneath the ground. <laughs> but they've sort of begun to put the theater together uh, in this picture. But uh, where you see what looks like snow, I, that's a place called Hierapolis. And it's across this big valley. And I can just see Paul coming across there. This is a little bit different view. It gives you a little bit more view of how, how far it is. Because Hierapolis and, uh, Laodice and Laodicea and the Colossae. Okay? Now, here's a look at it across a small lake they have there. Uh, you can see all that. That is not snow. That is salt. And I'll show you why here in just a second. But that's a fascinating place to go. And people from out throughout the area of all of Turkey would come here, many of them late in life. And they would actually stay here and be buried here. And we'll see why. There's another picture. Now, this is a cascade. And they have these little pools. And these pools are full of water. You ever heard of a jacuzzi? This is a natural jacuzzi. Uh, you go here and the water is wonderful. You always usually, you know, take it so you can wear something in there and sit down and relax. It really is nice. So people would come there older in life and they would actually spend their time in like a resort. And then die and then be buried. That's sort of what went on here. Uh, here's another view of it. Now, I don't know if you can hear this. You probably can't. But it's fine, it's fine, I don't have to. But it, it, you can hear the running water. But notice the steam. Now you've got to turn that picture around. <laughs> it doesn't, the water doesn't flow that way. You turn it around and you stand on that. And you, that is where you would walk into, but that's where the water went. And if you look at this, same thing. This is also running water. And if I had the video going here, I think I can make the video go at least. See that? And the water is rushing down there from that other place I showed you. This is all coming from underneath the ground. Wonderful hot springs. It's really nice. I've been in there several times. <laughs> and you just relax. And uh, this is the Cascades of the place called Hierapolis and very, very popular in the ancient world. The, the thing is, though, I want you to think then about the thing at Laodicea. You see where Laodicea was, you saw where Colossae was, and you see where this is, right? They're all in the same area, within a few miles of each other. And Colossae is well known for its very vibrant, refreshing, cold water. Hierapolis is known for its very warm and comforting, and mm, it really feels great, hot water. John says, I would rather you be hot, like Hierapolis, or be cold, like in Colossae, but you're neither one. You're basically worthless. <laughs> you have nothing to offer. You catch it? That's what would have been in the people's minds, or those things that were right by them that people viewed as, as outstanding attractions. And this would be known by everybody who read this. Uh, I must say the, some of the things I received as a kid on this were different. So, Anyway, this is a place called Hierapolis. It's a natural site, and it's one of the best ones to go to. They have a great hotel behind here, and you can get a chance to visit. You can get in the water, and you can enjoy looking at a lot of great sites that I don't even have here for you because I'm presenting several things to you. But there goes the water. This is the entrance to Hades for you. <laughs> There's another place of entrance that you can't see here, but... This is uh, where they would put the birds in and show people it was dangerous. What about Aphrodisias? Now, this is a place hardly anybody goes to, and yet it has some neat stuff. Uh, Aphrodisias is after the god Aphrodite. Anybody know the name? Also known as Venus. And so, the goddess of uh, whatever. So... Instead be love, I don't know how you want to classify all that with her. But the goddess of love. But uh, Aphrodite was very popular uh, in the ancient world. And uh, so you, you have something here that's fascinating. I went in there one day when I was at, at Aphrodisias, and there's some things to look at. They have a nice theater, but every, every, every site has a theater. They knew what it was to go to the theater. 
Every site in the Roman world and the Greek world has a theater. You just know it. <laughs> and so there's a really nice theater here. They have some also some other neat things. They got, you ever seen these kind of funny looking faces for the theater? These look clown looking kind of people? You know what I'm saying? Uh, that, that sometimes connected the theaters with these faces that are on. Anyway, they have them all over the place there. And they have some great columns and small theaters and, and places where they had music. and just It was a great place to visit, probably. And, but there's some neat things for us to understand there, too. Because there is on a couple of fo- uh, columns some important writing. Uh, it used to be that uh, some biblical scholars would say that Luke was not very accurate in what he wrote. Because a lot of things he wrote about simply never occurred, never were used. He just made it up. And the argument is the same thing they did with Hattusha, the Hittite kingdom in the north of Turkey. They they used to say the thing never existed because if it were so, we would know about it, you know. Well, all of a sudden it was found and they said, hmm, well, is something else we can talk about? Because they found a magnificent kingdom. I mean, magnificent. The first constitutional monarchy in the world. Now, it wasn't a, t- a dictatorship. It was interesting, constitutional. So it's a great place, and I'm not going to go into Hattusha with you. But the fact is that these sites like this uh, w- were very important in that they, uh, they have some features that help us to understand the New Testament. And so I've given you two examples here, and I have one more for you. But the first one is that there's a column that's about, oh, I don't know, maybe 20 feet high. It's very tall. And I was in there one day in the museum and looking at it and trying to read all the Greek words. because It's not easy to read because they're sort of faint, and they're not really clear. They need to be, you know, somebody knock them in a little bit more. But uh, I, could, I could make out most of the Greek, and I was reading through, and I found two words that were significant to the Bible because they are words that did appear in the Greek world, and scholars apparently didn't know this. Scholars don't know everything. Uh, Sometimes some people think they do. So here's the word theosibis, and we'll talk about that, and also the word theophilus. Now you know the word theophilus because Peter wrote, Peter, Luke wrote two books, one called the Gospel of Luke, the other called the Acts of the Apostles, right? And he writes both of them to a man by the name of Theophilus. And Was this a made-up person? Well, he has a perfectly good Greek name because we found it here at Aphrodisias. We also found the title for what is called a God-fearer. You ever seen that in the Bible? People that were God-fearers, they were not Jews, but they were attracted to the Jewish religion. Can you name me one? Cornelius, there we have, there's one right there. And there are several that we find in the text, people who were attracted to Judaism that finally became attracted to the Christian faith, which was based on the Jewish faith. And so the added dimension of Christianity. So uh, we have found examples of it. Now let's look at this one together. This is really hard, and I don't know if I can do it or not. I'm going to try it. That's not what I want. Well... I promise it's here. <laughs> I'm going to try to figure out how to get it big. See, uh, hmm. I'm afraid to click something and I might turn it off. <laughs> uh, you're just going to take my word for it. Right here at the top of this long column, it's broken into three categories. You have a bunch of words, like a big paragraph, and a break, big break. Bunch of par- you know, paragraph, a break, and finally another paragraph. It's got three paragraphs, big tall column. And I was looking at it trying to figure out what it said. And it's a long list of names uh, and, and, defini- and, and, and descriptions. And so what we have here on the, on the left is a reference to the man Theophilus. It has him as one of the people. They have a bunch of Greek names, and one is Theophilus. You know, philo- uh, Lover of God, Theophilus. Okay, but then at the bottom, where you see that little red, I found another word, and it's the word that is Theosibius, 
which is meaning one who fears God, a God fear. And we're going to show you another example of that in a minute. Now, I was trying to, when I was getting ready for this talk, I was trying to find where is that stupid name on this list? And I kept looking at it, looking at it. I said, I should have gotten a better picture. I mean, you know, I know it's here somewhere. So I went on the internet and uh, I did, you know, I was working on this. I went on the internet and I put in a thing into Google. I said, God fear the ancient world inscription, you know, something like that. And I clicked it and something came up that really surprised me. And I want to thank a lot of you because of the way it came out. It, sh it shocked me. I didn't realize. Here's the Google showing results for God fear. And of all things, the first two entries on this page is House Visual Study Bible. I said, I'm on the internet. <laughs> I thought, my goodness, I'm actually there. Uh, and, you know, if you get on the front page, if you get on the first page, particularly at the top, you know, you got top billing there, right? So I need that on everything I do now. <laughs> but I found this one, and that really surprised me, but I'll have another one for you in a moment. There's something there at Aphrodisius that you don't see everywhere. There are examples of it, but I have never seen any but this one. So I've been told, and I'm just saying this, I've been told that there are others other places. But this is at least one in Aphrodisius, which I think is pretty interesting because you have older women in the church that Paul talks about. And he also talks about the fact of women and their marriage and have children. And this famous little statement about, you know, how they should be reverent and behavior and not slanderers and this and that. And this is what it says, that they admonish the younger women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be so forth and so on. And I thought, that's interesting, to be lovers of their husbands and lovers of their children. And of all places, I found it here at Aphrodisius, right here. On a funeral thing, it was for a husband and wife. And the thing it mentions about the wife is that she's a lover of her husband and her children. The same exact statement in the Bible, which apparently was a well-known statement in the ancient world and picked up by the apostle to put in the text. So I thought that was pretty fascinating uh, in, in the passage. So I have actually a, a, a translation of this. Uh, and if you ever want it, you can read it. It's too long for us to take now. But they actually commemorated individuals who were well upstanding citizens. But one of the definitions of someone who's upstanding is a man and a woman. They had different qualifications. But for women that she, in fact, love her husband, love her children, was one of the ones that they put forward. And so that's what you find here at this, at this particular place. It's mentioned in Titus 2.4, if you ever read that. Now you're on to Miletus. Miletus is one of my favorite places. I love Miletus. Uh, Paul asked the people to come down to Miletus, and he did a good thing, because Miletus is a great site. Uh, here I am in the bath. At, uh, there's no water there. But every Greek city, every Roman city, in addition to a theater, every one had a bath. <laughs> All of them had public baths, and that's where you would go. And um, we're not to go into everything about that, but the fact is it was a very important part of the social life. People would go there, and they would talk, spend the evening, and all sorts of things. Time was used that way. They didn't have television to watch. Usually uh, games were not going on all the time, and so... They, uh, they had to figure out what to do with their time. And so usually in the afternoon, later or evening, they would go to the baths. And here's an example of one right here, which water used to be in. Now here's a theater at Miletus, and I'm going to show you another version of it. Um, I'm going to show you something very important here. One day, by the way, I have a video explaining all this, but it, I happened to be at Miletus that day, and it was raining. And I was trying to figure out, when's it going to stop? I want to do my video. And it kept going on and on and on. I finally just got an uh, umbrella, stood out there, had the guy stand under the awning, and I said, well, let me tape it. <laughs> and I taped it with all the rain coming down. But uh, there's, it's a fascinating sight. And here's another look at it. A big theater, has some great stuff on it, just some different angles for you. But here's what's important. It took me a while to find this. And when I found it, I actually videoed where it was 
so that I could show anybody how to find it because it takes a while to go through all of the seats in this big theater and find an inscription on a, one of the seats. And this actually is a, it's a nice size. I mean, it's, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, the various uh, seats they had, they, of course, they weren't individual. They were like a, not like this, like in a church pew, you know. They would go a long ways this way, this way, all the way around. And, and so you had to find the right place, and here it is. And it's hard to read all of this, and even if you know the language, but this is the word tapos, which in Greek means the place, the location, the place. And here's the word for Jew, eudeon, that is the Greek for Jew, it's for Hebrew. And then you have something odd here, and I'm not sure exactly how to translate it, and I've looked for others to give me guidance, and nobody really knows exactly how to do it. There's different opinions. But this is the word tone, which is in the Greek is, uh, means of the, or something like that, or from the. And so I'm not sure how it all fits together, because the next word is the word chi, kappa, alpha, iota, chi, which means and, or even. And then you have the word at, 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 at point, and this is the word, that's called theosibius, which means a fear of God, a God fear. And mentioning the Jews and the God fears in one lump is what you find in the New Testament, where the Jews and the ones who went to synagogue and who read the Hebrew or the, the Septuagint, the Greek Bible, in other words, they followed after the Jewish way of thinking. You had a place for them. It's the place of. And if you go around the theater and look, you'll find there's a place for certain people here. Certain they had reserved seating. I mean, that's I mean that's what it's got to be because they had designations for different kinds of groups <laughs> where you sit when you go to the theater. So there you have it. Uh, here's another angle of showing it. Uh, scholars in the 19th century used to say again that Luke did not know very much about the Greek world. The writing is not very well. He was not informed. He was sort of dumb. Uh, a guy by the name was Sir, uh, Sir William Ramsey, who was a, not, uh, not a believer and became a believer through one of the people who worked with him. And he was an archaeologist, though. He was a Greco-Roman archaeologist. And what would be good, he, would, he had the common knowledge that people had in the book learning up in England but he went on the sites, and they looked. And he had a guy who was a Christian with him and said, you know, he said, uh, certain search place, you know, we, we have uh, this thing done by Luke. And, he, and, and then they found an example of it, and he said, oh, well, Luke did know what he was talking about here. And he goes someplace else, and he finds something else, and he says, oh, well, this is what Luke has there, too. I mean, Luke does know this. And eventually, Ramsey became a believer and an outstanding scholar and a Christian, uh, and he said that, what, in fact, Luke was extremely accurate. The reason the people didn't know better because they're sitting up there in their, their chairs in Oxford and they weren't out on the field <laughs> and seeing it. And Ramsey wrote a book called The Cities of St. Paul, Paul the Traveler, and many other great books that you can buy. Uh, they're older, but they're still good. But this is an example of the word Asiarch. This is an example found at Miletus on a, on a wall uh, as you go in the theater. It's on the right as you go in, and it's there, and you can see the word Asiarch talking about the city leaders. But there's also another word, the word polytarch. It's not here, but you find polytarch talked about in Ephesus when Paul was about to be, <laughs> you know, they tried to keep Paul out of going into the theater because they were going to stone him. They were yelling for two hours, great as you know, great as Diana of the Ephesians. You know that story? You read that in the Bible? In the book of Acts? At the theater, when they were up in an uproar, they were yelling, great is our Diana of the, of the Ephesians. And they, the polytarchs came to him and convinced him not to go in front or he might cause a riot. Polytarch, nobody ever saw the word before, and yet it was found finally at Ephesus and some other places. So I always say this is archaeology catching up with the Bible. The Bible's true. I believe it with all my heart. The Bible is the Word of God, and the people who wrote knew what they were talking about. But some people need a little bit more information to make, make the jump. So here's an example of one of them here. 
I found this myself one day when I was looking uh, around the theater, and this is fascinating. And I had a friend of mine who works in that area uh, in which you have, uh, I, matter of fact, I have a whole article on it in the Visual Study Bible because this is fascinating because on the side of the theater, this is a thing about archangels protecting the people of Miletus. Look how that's structured. You have categories, look, one, two, three, four, five across, different groupings, and I even have the translation of it here if you want to look at it right here where it goes through and explains who's there, the various archangels, the various sub-angels under the archangels, and on and on. Uh, Michael's named as an archangel in various places, as you know, and Gabriel and so forth. So uh, here are examples, and Miletus also on the side of the theater. So there's several things there to look for. Guess what? <laughs> I was looking for this again on Google, <laughs> and there I am. <laughs> except three, use, three examples uh, on the top portion of the page, the first page. So I thought, well, I think it's because I have some wonderful people that are looking for stuff now. And as they look in the Bible, they come across it, and all of a sudden Google gets hold of it. I don't know how they do this stuff. But all of a sudden, this is where they're finding the information, which I think is really cool. So I appreciate you guys helping in that regard. Uh, there is so much to do. These are unfamiliar, but even places that are small and are not like Ephesus and Laodicea and not like Athens and Corinth, some of these smaller places have some fascinating information. And I didn't talk about everything. I gave you some examples. But um, what archaeology tells me is that uh, it informs me. It doesn't cause me to believe the Bible's true but it does help substantiate it for the purposes of talking to people who may not have that faith. And it also is helpful that it guides us to understand what the text is talking about oftentimes. So it's very, it's very fascinating to have this, a study of the ancient, you know, RK, the idea of beginning is the word beginning. In RK, in Alagas, in the beginning was the word uh, it's talking about the beginnings, and that's where we find out a lot of information that helps us to understand a book that is 2,000 years from us. You realize that? And yet it's still accurate because it came from God, and that's the reason why. Uh, one of these days I may actually do some stuff with you. Uh, I've, I've got a couple of books now in the makings not that I'm editing that I decided to get involved in because there are people now who are rejecting, uh, who claim to be evangelicals who are rejecting uh, the various accounts in the book of Genesis as being accurate and only mythical. And I, I have a hard time. Uh, evangelical, I think, relates to the fact that people believe in Christ for salvation. Uh, I think you can be a heretic and still probably, <laughs> you know, be a Christian by having wrong thinking. But uh, it disturbs me that people that would be in leadership and teaching would be pushing ideas that, for example, Genesis is not accurate, Abraham never lived, creation never happened, Adam and Eve never existed, and so forth. And uh, we may even talk about that sometime because I've got a number of scholars I'm putting together to write a couple of books on this area, uh, but one on the Old and one on the New Testament. And I'll talk more about that some other time, especially when I'm offline. <laughs> but... Uh, we try to just keep involved because our goal is to, to, uh, to encourage and to inform, to inspire uh, Christians to uh, hold faithful to the truth and the Bible. And, uh, and uh, if we're not doing that, I don't know why I'm here. <laughs> so I hope some of this helped. Any questions? I've only been up a little over an hour. I haven't gone to the second. Let me get the second uh, uh, PowerPoint out here. <laughs> Everybody's quiet. Well, you can talk to me after if you want to. I think the rain has stopped. You can escape. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be with you. It really is. And I love having fun with you. I was told uh, some of you are here, I said, I feel like this is our second church, even though we're down in Navistota, I feel like I sort of belong here too. 
<laughs> so it's, it's, a, it's really great to be with you. It really is. And I hope maybe next time we'll cover another area and a little bit different and cover some stuff that you maybe haven't thought about before. I try to find things that maybe you don't know about and share it with you. Well, I guess I should pray. Is that right? All right, let's pray. Uh, Lord, we just thank you for all your many, many blessings, and we thank you for uh, giving us the Word of God, which is faithful and true, and we know that uh, you, in fact, are true yourself, and you uh, have done something special in us through Christ that we could not do ourselves, but we, through his own death, uh, we have been made united with you. And so we just pray that our uh, week would go well, that we would uh, be able to minister to others, that we'd be able to proclaim the name of Christ and glorify in our salvation through him. And we pray all of this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.